to, to welcome you all to the uh, second annual John Jane Lecture Show. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you all with us. Um, today we have the honor of hosting Dr. Stephen Rue. He is a neurosurgeon and uh, acts as chair at the um, neurosurgery at the Palo Alto Medical Foundation and also as an adjunct professor of electrical engineering. Um, so really a great honor today. He's one of the world leaders in not just neurosurgery, but also electrical engineering and uh, works with the cutting edge research on the brain um, kind of uh, electrical interfaces, which is really the cutting edge of, of what you can see in our paralyzed patients. So really a great honor to have you with us uh, today. Um, our lecture today is going to be on MIS uh, durotomy and dural repair, um, all of the questions that we uh, have but are too afraid to ask. So really a great honor to have you with us today, Dr. Rue. Um, and uh, with no more further ado, uh, we'll turn it over to you. Great, thank you. Good morning, everybody. And thank you for having me here. Can you hear me well? Yes, we can hear you very well. Fantastic, yeah, thanks for giving me the opportunity to speak. Um, it's funny because there's obviously so many topics I could speak about. And uh, this sort of talk came up as a result of a conversation I have with some friends. As you guys all know, if you're doing spine surgery and if you're doing MIS surgery, obviously durotomies are something we sort of don't talk about because uh, we don't like to admit that they happen. Um, let me just start here with my presentation here. Let me see. Can you see my slides? Yes, coming across well. Wonderful. Great. So yeah, thanks for the introduction. I'll start with this slide right over here. So everyone has seen a, a durotomy. I mean, it's sort of like that thing they say, if you have a, a complication and you say you have no complications, you're either lying or you haven't done any cases or you haven't operated enough. And as you know, durotomies are one of those cases, uh, one of those complications that all of us get. Um, they're not things that we like to talk about, and but they're things that actually happen probably more frequently than we like to admit. And they happen with all sorts of spine surgery. Obviously, the open surgeries are much easier to treat. Uh, in MIS, though, there are some challenges that can be posed. Um, I remember many, many years ago having a conversation with a bunch of MIS surgeons, and we were talking about how do you repair durotomies and how do you manage durotomies. And it turned out that people are all over the place. Uh, some people said, I don't. Some people say that I do. Some people said, you don't have to really bother doing a good job. It's MIS. Some people kept them flat. Some people didn't keep them flat. Some people put in drains. And if you put them in drains or you kept them flat, you'd leave them flat for 24 hours. You'd leave them flat for 72 hours. Kind of all over the place, you know. And this is many, many years ago. And since then, I've been managing these the way I've been taught in residency or with some changes after discussions with friends. And over the years, I've just kind of managed them the way I wanted to. But more recently, I was having a conversation with some other people about um, literally what's the science and the literature about this and what justifies the things that we do. And it turns out um, a lot of there's a lot of good research and data out there that perhaps most people haven't really been updated into because they're talking about other things that might be more interesting. So it's very interesting. I started asking some questions about this, very fundamental questions about durotomies and trying to get into some answers. And this sort of was the, the nucleus of a, of, a, of a talk that I gave, that um, a topic I started talking about that actually had a lot of interest. So I thought it'd be fun to share with you guys here as well too. So as you can see in the picture here, I mean, everyone knows what this is, right? This is a CSF leak. I know everyone says, you know, it was dry when I closed, there was no leak, but then this happens. We've all been there, this occurs. Um, but what do you do in these sorts of situations, especially when you're in cattle and when you're in surgery? So first thing I'll start to talk about, what is the actual incidence of durotomies? And we call these incidental durotomies because they happen incidental to the operation. But in the past, they have been called things like unintended, accidental, or unplanned. We try to avoid any sort of terminology that people may uh, make look like a mistake. So therefore, incidental durotomies is sort of how they've been um, accepted, I think, when we talk about when they happen. Now, the incidence rate varies highly in the literature, anywhere between 1% to 17% for all lumbar surgeries. And as you can imagine, when you look at studies that are looking for the incidence of durotomy, they tend to be higher. And for uh, papers where they're studying one surgical technique versus another, the incidence is much lower. Um, but on balance, if you review the hundreds, actually, of 
papers that discuss incidence of deuteronomies or refer to them, and probably a good dozen or so papers that do look at them, um, they show that the incidence rate is somewhere around 10%, to be honest. And I don't know what you quote patients when you talk to them, but this is interesting because I know when I consent my patients, I tell them, oh, the risk of heart attack, stroke, and death is very, very low. You could have a CSF leak, but that's also quite low. 10% actually isn't a low number. It's actually a real number. And obviously with other sorts of operations, they can increase. So one to 17%. And most people will say, oh, my incidence rate isn't that high. But you know, having any sort of tear whatsoever, whether it's symptomatic or not, is probably higher than you'd like to admit. But I think there's no shame in that as long as you understand that. Now, they have done a lot of research that has shown that with MIS versus open surgery, it's very similar. I remember very early on, people say, oh, with MIS surgery, you know, through a tubular attractor, I will get a deuteronomy regularly. And I said, wow, that's interesting. Um, and I remember one of the old experts used to say, oh, yeah, I think it should be considered just part of the operation. Uh, fortunately, that hasn't come to pass. Over time, I think what's happened is the techniques and experience have gotten better. And as a result, the instance of deuteronomy is, should be uh, no different than open surgery if you're careful and meticulous. The instance for endoscopic spine surgery, which also I will lump in with um, minimally invasive spine surgery because it truly is minimally invasive as well, is about 1% to 5% reported in the literature with the same caveats. Now, if you look at when they're more likely to occur, they are least likely to occur with a virgin back during a primary discectomy. They're more likely to occur in spinal stenosis. And finally, revision operations also are more likely to have issues. There's some very interesting data about when do deuteronomies occur. And it's, uh, if you look at some of the uh, papers out there, they say that deuteronomy is generally associated with longer duration of operation. Um, it's something probably the more technically challenging, there's more issues. The older the patient, I think we've all experienced older patients with very thinned out dura, especially if you're a neurosurgeon, if you've done a craniotomy, you know when you turn a flap sometimes that dura comes right out with the bone because it's very thinned out and it's very stuck. Revision operations are also more likely to have deuteronomies. And fascinating, one of these studies, cases that start after 4 p.m. are more likely to get deuteronomies. And that could also be just due to technical and cognitive fatigue. What it's not associated with is that neurosurgeon orthopedics from a specialty basis doesn't seem to make a difference. The number of years of training you have doesn't make much of a difference. And the BMI of a patient doesn't make much of a difference, which are other things people are, think have been associated with having deuteronomies. The Japanese did an interesting study, and um, they were looking at the location of deuteronomies. And not surprisingly, if you have a disc herniation, it's most associated with discs. Uh, if you're doing a decompression, and those who've done a lot of decompressions and have deuteronomies know it usually occurs in the lateral recess very far, or at the inferior and superior edge of your decompression, when you do that one last bite, and all of a sudden you get a little bit of fluid leak. The other thing they also showed was a facet cyst also more likely to cause deuteronomies than if you're doing a surgery for a disc or stenosis. Uh, I think this is true. Uh, spondylolisthesis also because of the shift in the spine. Anything that I think where you have close adhesion causes issues. I know whenever I take out synovial cysts, sometimes they look they're integrated right with the dura and you pull them off and you're like, wow, I think there's like one layer of dura was removed with that cyst, you know, and it's very, very thinned out. There's something about that. So I think this is true as well, too. Now, the instance of deuteronomy endoscopic spine surgery has been studied. Recently, there's a paper where they actually went and talked to all the great experts in endoscopic spine surgery. And what they found out was the inner laminar approach was more likely to cause a deuteronomy versus Kamen's triangle um, transforaminal, which makes sense. Um, having little experience and a lot of experience was interesting associated with it as well too. And the authors attribute to that to a learning curve at one end and the other end, once you've done a lot, you tend to be a bit more aggressive and take on bigger cases. Two thirds of patients did not have an issue. Interesting, one third of patients who did have a deuteronomy ended up with a CSF leak and or new radiculopathy. What was very interesting is 18% of these patients eventually developed CSF fistulas that required additional uh, um, additional intervention. So though endoscopic spine surgery is quite minimally invasive, it is not immune to having complications with CSF leak. Though you may believe it's such a minimal trap, it'll close up and won't cause a problem. Um, this is actually a pretty highly and unexpected result that they reported. Now, why are deuteronomies important? I'll tell you, 
everybody knows, oh, well, they're a pain in the ass. They cause headache, nausea, and vomiting. You could have infection, uh, pseudomeningoceles. Those are all true. We're all aware of those issues. But really one of the other things that people probably do not consider as much with durotomies is it increases the cost of surgery. It increases the cost of your admission if you're keeping them a long time. It increases the time in the operating room, which costs more money as well, too. And also, you might need reoperations, which also increase costs and complicates things down the line. So there's a fiscal penalty to having a durotomy. And the other interesting thing, this is a very interesting piece of data I didn't know before. Medical legally speaking, it is the second most frequent cause of spine surgery lawsuits. Uh, number one being, you know, failure to recover from whatever happened. Uh, wrong level doesn't happen that often. But if you have a spinal leak, um, patients often will basically consider that to be a, a something that shouldn't have happened in surgery. And if they have a bad outcome, uh, they will sue you. And interestingly, even though patients who have had durotomies have the exact same outcome, they had the durotomy, you repaired it, nothing happened their overall satisfaction with you and the operation is less. So you may not consult people for spinal CSF leaks and spinal leaks, but given the incidents and the fact that there's medical legal repercussions, I think it's actually very important to mention that it is something that does happen not infrequently and something that um, is that something you can handle and usually doesn't cause a problem. My experience has been with patients is as long as you tell them what is going to happen or what could happen, they usually recall that. It's when they have something unexpected that happens that then it's a much more challenging conversation to have. So how do you manage a durotomy? And I'm sure there's a combination of any of the final following techniques. So I'd like to talk about the techniques first before we sort of get into the actual nuts and bolts of what you actually do. Now, primary closure, everybody knows what that is using a patch, using sealants, covering the tissue, converting to open, obviously, is something that you might do, especially in MIS surgery, uh, drainage, bed rest, and then obviously close follow-up. But everybody probably uses some combination of the following. Now, dural closure is obviously the gold standard. Uh, I was taught in residency that water is a very small molecule. Indeed it is. It will find its way out of even the best of closures. Um, and from neurosurgery as well. I've had many patients who so I've closed completely tightly. It was totally dry. And then they have a pseudomeningocele. You go back in, you explore them and you find the leak. And it is a one tiny half a millimeter hole at the edge of the dura somewhere that decided not to seal. The dura does a great job sealing, but on the other hand, sometimes it doesn't. We also have patients who have had dura eroded through the cell and they're leaking spinal fluid out of the nose and do it for months or years and they never get a meningitis which is fascinating and then you have the one patient who has a lumbar operation with a small leak and all of a sudden their wound is leaking csf and they end up with a meningitis or some combination like that which again it happens it happens to everybody um, at some point in time uh, no matter how good you are as a surgeon so we're taught that primary dural closure is the gold standard because if you do that, it gives the body the maximum chance of actually sealing up and not causing a problem. And this can be very challenging in an MIS environment because the tubes are small. You're trying to make it as small as possible in your approach. So you got to push those nerve roots back in. And working down a long channel, your instruments, it's much more challenging to basically do that. But again, primary dural closure is probably whatever I was familiar with. This is how I uh, have developed my primary dural closure set. I use the following things, which I think are very critical. The first thing is I use a 6O Gore-Tex needle. The way I, reason I use a 6O Gore-Tex suture is that the needle is actually smaller than the suture. Oftentimes you'll put in a needle and the needle will be bigger than the suture and then you closed tightly. And what happens, it'll like you tear the dura a little bit or stretch it. And now you've got a bigger hole and the thing is weeping. One thing is weeping is very hard because you try to close additionally, it's very challenging. The cortex sutures work pretty well. I use this in the, um, the cranial closure sometimes as well too. Uh, usually not as necessary, but in the spine, almost exclusive when I'm closing the dura, uh, this is what I will use. Uh, uh, I also have micro Castro Viejo drivers and these drivers are tough to use, but they are very easy to use um, compared with bayoneted instruments down a tube. And finally, the micro ring tip forceps I find invaluable both in um, 
open and in um, MIS surgery. The reason is they're atraumatic. When you have a spinal tear or dural tear, you're stressed out, you're very anxious about it. You grab your forceps with the teeth and they can actually damage the edges of the dura. They can tear the edges of dura, leads to your frustration. These ring forceps are very small and also they're atraumatic. So I find them very helpful. I use these in my cranial cases as well too. So this is what I do to basically do my closures through a tube. I think many other people have very similar setups like this. There's a lot of co-evolution, as you can imagine, because all of us have been there before. Uh, there's some other devices out there as well, too, that are manufactured. Um, this is one by a company called Durastat. And what it does is it allows you to fire sutures very simply in, and then you can drop the edges and close. And as you can see, this is actually very nice to use through a small tube. And when you're very frustrated because you really can't close that suture, and it, it, it's, you know, it does like the nerves or roots are in the way, devices like this uh, can be very, very helpful because it sort of takes the stress away from actually trying to fire those sutures, especially at the edges. And this is a relatively recently new developed product. There are some other products out there. I think Medtronic had a little clip product out in the day, uh, which I think has been discontinued. I don't see any more information about that. These are some other dural closure devices that have been developed. One is a Durafuse, which is a newer product. I think it's uh, made out of Oregon or something. Very similar. It's a, it's a product to help basically close the dura that's resorbable. Uh, Lemaitre over here actually makes vascular clips, but their vascular clips are put onto a little deployable um, device that is... Uh, very small and easier to use down a tube. And you can see down below an example of some closures using this device. Um, I put these articles up as well too, because this device is actually used in endoscopic spine surgery as well, because they do have some dural tears. Um, uniportal versus biportal endoscopy is quite different. Biportal endoscopy is very similar to doing tubular oh, micro open, sorry, MIS surgeries, except using a much smaller opening. And in these, you have the same amount of space, but you have very small um, portals into the spine. And as a result, you have to use a small device. <clears throat> so they've used these vascular clips as an example. Uniportal, however, is very different. It's very hard to do direct closure in uniportal. And one of the things I bring up here is that they have shown that with uniportal, all they can really do is irrigate a lot and irrigate a lot, and irrigate a lot, and maybe inject some sealant. And one of the issues with constant irrigation is that can actually cause some issues because you're now putting force through fluid that can actually affect the brain as well too. The next category of things you might use are what I call patches and plugs. Uh, you may be familiar with these. Fat is a very commonly used uh, patch or plug because it's easily harvestable, especially in open surgeries. Muscle, um, I remember during training, I was taught to take muscle pieces and strap that on to sort of back up a dural repair. Periosteum can also be used as well too. And um, I think from cranial surgeons, we'll take the periosteal flap and we'll lay it over the dura sometimes. Fascia lata has also been used as a patch or a plug, especially before the advent of, um, many of these are before the advent of dural repair substitutes, which are now manufactured, as you can see, like um, Duragen is a collagen sponge you can onlay and use as a patch. There are sewable ones, there's onlay forms. Uh, you can also get things like, I think there's other Med Medtronic and other people also come out with dura, um, dural substitutes you can sort of sew onto the area too. Taco seal is a fiber and sealant patch as well too, which is widely, uh, widely used and is fairly generic. This also has been used as a onlay patch as well too. Uh, finally, blood patches is an interesting thing. And a transfer flap is, as you can see, taking actually a whole pedic pediculated uh, uh, soft tissue and then flapping that over. Transphenoidal surgeries, oftentimes um, ENT will take a little vascularized um, periosteal you know, sinus flap and put that over a pituitary closure. Similar fashion, some people have advocated taking pediculated muscle flaps and putting that over. And most of these honestly are there to kill the dead space. And I'll touch on that a little bit more later as well too. Uh, I wanna talk about sealants really briefly. I'm sure everyone is filled with sealants in particular fibrin glue. Many of you guys who do spine surgery probably have been taught to use fibrin glue, use fibrin glue, fibrin glue is good to seal sort of time. So, so fibrin glue is very common. But in addition to that, there's been a market for other products, in particular, um, Adherus and DuraSeal are very commonly used products to actually specifically use to seal the Dura, and they've had some good um, research and data, and they um, have been supporting this for quite some time, and this is used both in the spine and the brain. 
One concern I'll say about Duracell that came out is there's multiple versions of Duracell. One version is basically the one they use in the brain, but it expands. And a lot of these seals will expand. Duracell Extract Exact is a newer version. It's used specifically as a spine on label indication. And that actually does not expand as much. The concern obviously is if you inject something that expands, it can cause mass effect. And if you're on the spinal cord in a smaller area, it could cause more issues um, down the line. But sealants have been an area of active investigation uh, commercially as well too. I'll talk about blood patches briefly. When I was in training, um, actually not in training, I remember many years ago, I was talking to a friend of mine, I said, what do you guys do when you get um, durotomies, when you're doing like an MIS tubular discectomy? And they said, oh, well, actually, I just take a little piece of gel foam, I soak it in blood and put it right on there. It's like a blood patch. And I said, oh, wow, that makes a lot of sense. You know, How do you treat occult CSF leaks after a lumbar puncture? You do a blood patch, right? Or that's what we send them off to do. So using a blood patch has also generated a lot of interest in particular because it's very cheap. <clears throat> you can draw blood, anesthesia can draw blood, you can use local blood in the area. Placing it interoperative essentially gives you a very cost-effective, cheap way of managing a durotomy. <clears throat> and there's been some studies that looked into this as well too to sort of support the use of blood into the epidural space because it's available. And finally, using drains, lumbar drainage using a lumbar catheter, uh, very commonly placed by neurosurgeons. These obviously do a great job diverting a flow, but they can be, um, they can cause other issues as well too. They're unpleasant for the patient as well. Subfascial drains, you know, I was taught never to use a subfascial drain because if you put a drain right over the CSF leak, it's going to suck up more CSF and the wound will never close. It turns out that's not true. Um, some indications actually say you should use subfascial grain to gravity because what it does is sucks off any of the CSF that leaps through the incision while it's trying to heal. And by just doing that amount of uh, pressure decompression on the area uh, decreases the amount of um, uh, flow and results in the CSF, sorry, the derivative of the heal itself. And I'll talk more about the evidence supporting all of this in my next section right here. But now that you've talked about all the techniques that are available to manage them, I mean, how do you actually manage durotomy? What is the evidence that supports how you manage incidental durotomies? So I'm going to go into the literature now of what's been out there. And this has been studied for a long time. There's actually a lot of literature on how to sort of manage durotomies, even though I think Many of us learn how to manage durotomy as more of like a word of mouth. Uh, this is how it was taught in residency. Um, and many of these things may not have been as um, reviewed over time. So here's a study that came on 2001 in World Neurosurgery, 2021 World Neurosurgery, where they looked at many cases across 11 different studies and they're probably trying to figure out which um, repair technique was most effective. And what they determined was a primary closure with a patch or graft that was most successful. So doing a primary closure and then covering it on top with some kind of a graft or a sealant was the most successful with it. It had only a 5.5% CSF leak rate. But again, this is when you know you have a durotomy and you seal it, there's still a 5% leak rate. So you, know, you will get a leak if you have a durotomy sometime during your career. Using a sealant as an adjunct to primary closure didn't actually um, reduce the CSF leak compared with primary closure alone. So primary closure really was the most critical thing, even though people commonly back that up with a patch or graft. Sealant alone and patch alone had the highest CSF rate, but that of course could be due to the fact that it was probably a, uh, maybe a leak that couldn't be closed primarily. The next uh, piece of data I'll look at is fibrin glue. Everyone uses fibrin glue when they're cold. Well, not everyone, I'm talking about many people use fibrin glue. And I was taught to use fibrin glue once I have a CSF leak in order to help with the sealant, right? But it turns out there's literature from back as too far as 2009 that shows that the use of fibrin glue didn't really significantly decrease the incidence of a CSF leak. In 2016, they actually did a... Um, systematic review of the literature on fibrin glued using for dural sealants. And there was actually many studies that looked at it. And what it turned out was there's actually very little evidence to support fibrin glue as actually decreasing your um, post-operative CSF leak when used alone as a sealant for CSF leaks for Durant. It makes you feel better, but it actually didn't seem to make a difference. As a matter of fact, there was a higher post-op CSF leak when you use fibrin glue in one of these um, um, studies, and that was the only single randomized control trial comparing fibrin glue versus um, um, different closure techniques, which is very interesting. 
So there's some other studies, and this is a very interesting study that was done in a lab where they had a model of dural closure, and then they tried various dural sealants on it and saw which ones actually ruptured and failed. And they, they looked at nine commonly available dural sealants, including many of the ones I just uh, mentioned as well too. And what they showed was of the ones out there, adherus had the highest mean burst pressure, meaning it was the most resistant to rupture followed by Tacoseal, which was an onlay um, substitute, followed by Duraseal. So the commercially developed products for sealants, Duraseal and Heres, did seem to have um, a better job of closing the Dura compared with Tisseal. As you notice here, that the, um, the fibrin glues um, were, didn't actually do a very, very good job. Um, but what they did mention was, due to the high cost of the sealants and the results which show that they were resistance, but they weren't, you know, none of them, were tremendously resistant. Uh, they advocated a critical attitude for sealant application as an adjunct to dural closure. So here's a study that came out that looked at the management of incidental dural tears, whether you should suture or not suture. And basically they compared in this study, primary closure versus primary closure and patch versus using an onlay, in this case, they use taco seal, plus minus muscle or fat to close the area. And they actually didn't show um, a difference in outcome in any of the groups. But what was more interesting in the study was they showed that bed rest and drainage did not affect the outcome in any of the studies. So one thing they did show though was drainage to strong suction had significantly higher revision surgery rates. So basically if the suction was actively sucking out CSF, this seemed to affect the rate of having to go back and do a repair. And this goes back to uh, you know, using enough suction to wick off any CSF that was leaking through the hole that couldn't be stopped versus actually trying to drain off CSF. So another question you might ask was, how long do you keep people flat for? How long do you actually do you get them out of bed immediately? And again, this is an area of wide debate, but there has been good, um, some good studies based on this as well too. So if you look at the studies that are published here, they looked at nine studies over thousands of articles. And what they discovered once again was primary closure with fat graft was most successful versus muscle. And here they're looking at muscle versus fat uh, as a graft. But what they noticed there was no benefit to bed rest versus early ambulation. If you did a good job sealing them, getting them up and around was fine. However, if you left them in bed for a long time, you got them up, they were gonna leak one way or another. It didn't really seem to matter. Subfascial drains reduce the pseudomeningocele rate, medical complication, and return to OR. So in this study where they looked at many patients, it turned out putting in a subfascial drain was actually beneficial because it reduced the pseudomeningocele rate, which caused, we could cause issues down the line. And obviously, if you leave in a drain, you've got to worry about infection. You got to worry about them being pulled out. You have to worry about other issues that are associated with the drains. Now there are, like I said, many other studies have actually looked at the ambulation after surgery. And I thought this was interesting because I've known people who will keep people flat for a day. Some people keep people flat for three days. Some people keep people flat for, you know, just 12 hours. It's sort of all over the place. But the data actually has been, um, the results from all these studies show that early ambulation versus greater than 24 hour bed rest didn't seem to affect the outcome. So they're gonna leak if they're gonna leak. If you basically leave them flat, it doesn't really seem to make them less likely to leak. But what bed rest was associated with, obviously, was longer stays in the hospital and more medical complications. And this could be a result of them having to lay in bed, you know, not getting around and having other complications, issues associated with that. So more and more, it seems like early ambulation is encouraged in the patients, who, even if they have durotomies, even in the lumbar spine. So then this comes to the question. I mean, what should I do, right? So I've told you the techniques that are available and uh, the literature that supports that. Um, I've sort of answered a bunch of questions about which techniques are most likely to be helpful and how do you sort of manage peri procedurally in sort of deuteronomy. So how do you sort of synthesize that into what do you do? So one of the things I'll sort of present out here too, this is a study that was done recently where they actually interviewed a bunch of surgeons and sent out surveys and asked them, hey, what do you guys do with interoperative durotomies? And as you can imagine, sort of, you know, the responses are a bit all over the place. And this again is a, is a response. So, you know, what you would like to do is often different from what you end up doing depending on the situation, right? So here, primary closure, 95% of surgeons said they do primary closure, which is great. I mean, that's our goal. We want to do primary closure. 
Uh, a vast majority also use sealants, which once again, a lot of data supports that we like to do the belts and suspenders. We like to do the primary closure, but you know, just in case, I like to throw a little extra something on top of them. That is very common. Now, after that, you know, graphs, drainage, things like that, not, not so much, you know, those are sort of a bit more all over the place. What's fascinating is one to 2% of um, surgeons say they actually don't manage them at all, um, which is interesting. They didn't actually go into details of what their thinking was, um, but that was quite interesting. And this also harkens back to the people who do endoscopic spine surgery and the conversation I had with some of my colleagues many, many years ago, where they said that, yeah, in, in minimal invasive surgery, uh, there's, no, there's no dead space. Everything just sort of closes up and seals it. So I, I don't think it's a real problem, right? So I think there's some people who still think that as well. Post-operative management, 75% of these surgeons do, do bed rest. And once again, I think bed rest makes you feel a bit better. You know, the patient had a leak. I want everything to sort of seal together. It's going to take 24, 48 hours for that to happen. Um, so they'll keep on bed rest. An interesting number of people did put them on antibiotics. This exceeds the number of people to put them on drains. I thought that was interesting. Only 18% of people had immediate uh, mobilization, actually didn't really care. 14% uh, of patients um, actually would go back and reoperate on them. I'm not sure if this was in a delayed fashion or not, but I do think it's good to have a low threshold to reoperate because CSF leaks left untreated can obviously cause pain issues in the long run. And interestingly, 5% of patients did nothing postoperatively different from what they typically do. Um, they just got them up, walked them around, said, go home, do whatever. I think everything's going to be fine. So when you come up with an algorithm for how you're actually going to treat um, gerotomies, especially in an MIS setting, I think it's very important to sort of look at what do you do in a closed setting, right? So sorry, in an open setting. So this is actually a good review paper that came out by Will Welch and his group looking at, um, you know, how do they review, uh, how do they manage open gerotomies? And what they said was you always attempt to direct repair, which again, in open surgery, I think all of us agree, there's a large dead space, there's a large area CSF is going to want to flow into. Um, you always want to test your repair with a Valsalva. And even in MIS surgery too, I will generally have them test uh, to see if there's a leak. Uh, one of the issues, of course, is sometimes you lose so much CSF that may not be as, um, uh, as reliable. They use a non-absorbable suture, which again, I think is good. I use 60 Gore-Tex, which is a non-absorbable suture as well too. They always use a drain. Now, I know when I was in training, I was taught when you have a CSF leak in an operation in lumbar or thoracic or cervical spine, not to put in a drain. Uh, but again, more and more the data shows you know, that putting a drain is probably a good idea. But if you put in a drain, you do not put it to bulb suction to actively suck. Uh, that was one of the concerns, um, I think. You don't want to put a drain to an active suction, and um, that has happened in the past. And if you put in a drain, there's a chance something could happen. Uh, in this case, you want to put it to a drain that's under low suction, but drains can be helpful. And the open surgery, because there's always a lot of uh, bleeding and a lot of fluid that collects in order to prevent a subfascial fluid collection, we put in a drain. Same goes with CSF, and it doesn't seem to make much of an issue. Um, oh, and then closing the dead space was a very important thing. You know, if you have dead space, the less dead space you have, the better it is. And closing of the dead space doesn't necessarily mean closing your suture together, because after you've done a large laminectomy, closing the suture together, it's called, you know, the dead space closure sutures. As you know, when you go back in for an infection or for a CSF leak, they're really not doing anything. You're just sort of reapproximating them to try to do a little bit of something. But what they basically promote here is really going in and trying to cover it up and filling the dead space with something, either fat or muscle or something to sort of bulk it up a little bit. And I think this is important in MIS surgery as well, too, and I'll get to that in a second. So the algorithm they came up with was you have an incidental gerotomy identified in the OR do primary closure with direct repair and, or muscle patch, and then add a drain. If that doesn't work, take them back to surgery, uh, reclose, and then really cover it up with a flap, and then put in here, they're actually, they put in a spinal subarachnoid drain, which actually I'm, I have never done for one of these cases, and a subfascial drain. If it doesn't work, they put in a lumbar puncture and put in a drain. Um, I have found that um, if you have a leak in the person, they have a CSF leak, going in and repairing them can be effective, but then it's always good to make a decision because if you go in and do a repair and then you actually have to go back again because it doesn't work, you over. So 
Lumbar drainage generally tends to be very effective. And if there's no contraindication to doing that, um, I'm generally a fan of doing a lumbar drain. There are people that I know that'll put a drum lumbar drain in, in lieu of doing a re-exploration. I think that's fine as well. So let's say you have a CSF leak, it hasn't healed, um, and you're trying to decide whether to take them back or not, putting a lumbar drain can be a good alternative. And I'll touch on that in a second when I get to some summaries here. So how do you manage an incidental duronum and minimally the spine surgery? This is a pretty good paper that came out many, many years ago about a sort of an algorithm and a tree of what to do to manage a duronomy. And again, they said in their MIS experience, nine and a half percent of patients had an unintended duronomy. Once again, emphasizing the incidence of duronomies in spinal surgery is not low. Um, I would categorize that as something that is you, you ought to disclose to patients because it is in the 10% range, not the less than 1% range. And if you look at this, um, oh, and the other thing I'll mention about durotomies is I have seen patients who have been perfectly dry present to clinic, you know, weeks or even months later um, with uh, a pseudomeningocele. And I've seen patients, I'm sure all of you have, who've come back after surgery and you reimage them and they've had surgery years ago by another surgeon somewhere else. They still have a sizable pseudomeningocele. It's quite interesting. So, so the algorithm they came up here for minimally of his spine surgery, durotomy repairs. If you have a durotomy, with partial thickness, put on some glue and bed rest overnight. Durotomy, full thickness, can you repair it? Please repair it once you've repaired it. And here are these for a neuron. Is it watertight? Yes. Throw on some fiber and glue, bed rest overnight. If it's not watertight, uh, add something on top of it like fiber and glue or muscle glass or collagen matrix and then bed rest overnight. If you can't close it primarily, then put on a blood-soaked gel foam, once again, the whole blood patch idea, plus fiber and glue, and bed rest overnight. Now, I think it's a pretty decent algorithm, the way about thinking thing. I think based on some of the literature out there, this, um, this, uh, this stuff they're saying here is really more of a personal preference rather than an absolute, this is, a, this is something you should do. You could combine different things together, like you could put on a blood-soaked gel foam as well as fiber and glue, or you could just put on an onlay graft, as I've explained earlier. And in these patients, they kept them all overnight for bed rest, um, just to um, just out of surgeon preference, right? But I think this is overall pretty good algorithm, a good way of thinking about how things are, and I'll touch on that in a second as well, too. Endoscopic spine surgery is very interesting. Endoscopic spine surgery. I want to touch base on this and how they repair this is quite interesting. 9% um, of people that did endoscopic spine did attempt a direct repair. A 90 plus percent did not. They just said it wasn't possible. It was very hard to do and they really couldn't deal with it. Uh, and many of them pretty much injected sealant in the area. They put in Duracell or Tisseal or tried to inject something in the area. Now, one of the things of endoscopy is constantly a fluid flowing in the area here. And because you have fluid flowing in the area, it's kind of hard to make these things stick. Um, they also had mentioned a high level of reticulopathies afterwards too. And I'm not sure if that's because they're injecting, you know, this sealant into the Campbell's triangle in the foramen, and that's causing some irritation of the nerve. No one knows for sure. 90% of patients did nothing at all. They just said, well, these are hard to repair. I'm not going to repair these. Uh, and many of them, interestingly, did have more than half of them put them on extreme bed, well, like extended bed rest for more than 48 hours, which I thought was quite interesting, you know, uh, versus when we do like MIS uh, surgeries through a tube, we usually will keep them that flat. And they did conclude that most can be managed with mechanical compression or and gel foam or sealant that will put down the tube. Um, but half of the surgeons actually didn't feel they actually had much training. So once they got the CSF leak, they're like, oh my gosh, you know, what do I do in this sort of situation? And again, I will emphasize that 18% of these patients developed a fistula, which I think is quite high. Um, in my uh, opinion, it's, it's pretty high relative to what we see with MIS surgery. And perhaps that is just because they didn't actually treat a lot of these patients because these techniques were a bit more challenging. So uh, spinal leaks and endoscopy is minimally invasive, which is great, but managing these tears is um, a bit of a challenge in an area of more, um, yeah, more research where it's necessary. Now, if you actually look at this paper as well, too, published in 2021, the guys who actually respond to these, um, I think I'm, I, I'm grateful for their honesty, um, but these are actually some of the top endoscopists in the world you know, who are reporting this stuff. So if you actually look at all the data that I've presented so far, 
Um, and you sort of synthesize it. I made a rough stab at kind of like what I think is being justified and what I've seen out there and how I would manage, you know, interop and durata based on this. And this is sort of the, sort of an algorithm I came up with based on this. So if you have an interrupter Rodney, the first question you ask is you have a CSF leak, right? Because you know, you might have torn off one layer of dura, you might have torn off a little hole of dura, you might have that pinhole and you've got a little blub of arachnoid, but there's no active CS leak through during the entire operation. What do you do? On this sort of case, I think attempting a direct repair, most of us wouldn't try to do that because in doing so, you're probably gonna cause a CSF leak. We've all had those cases where you have a little hole or you've got a little bit of arachnoid, but nothing ever happens. And even though the arachnoid is very thin, it's strong enough to sort of resist, uh, you know, rupture. So in these cases, doing an on-layer sealant is, is optional, but I think a lot of us probably would. And the on-layer sealant, you could put a blood patch, you could put your on-layer of choice that you want to put on top, you could put in fiber and glue, you could put whatever. Honestly, I think it's optional to do this, but if you want to do that, but one of the things I'm going to go back to is why I think a lot of people use fiber and glue and why a lot of people, you know, do things. You want to sort of fill that dead space as a plug because in MIS surgery, I do believe the tissues do close up and you do have less of a track. That's, I think, one of the reasons why you can get a hematoma that's much more symptomatic when you're doing tubular surgery because there's just not a lot of room. So it does resist um, something coming out to the skin in 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 inherently, but not perfectly, right? So I think when you're putting fiber and glue into that hole in the area there, what you're really doing is you're putting a little bit of a plug. You're filling up the dead space to give a little bit of resistance to whatever is coming out in that space there. And bed rest, honestly, is probably unnecessary. Early mobilization after someone who doesn't have a leak is probably is probably warranted, um, given the fact that even if you have a leak, it's questionable whether you should keep someone in bed or not. Now you have a leak, is primary repair possible? The answer is, well, I'll start with no, I can't. And then you sort of end up with a situation of, you know, well, I'm gonna have, in this case, I should probably do an on layer of sealant of some sort. Uh, there are many choices, like I said, you could choose from. Um, again, fiber and glue, I actually don't really consider to be a, a sealant in this case. It's really something um, that you use to uh, fill the dead space. If you can place a drain, that's a bit more challenging in MIS surgery. Uh, with a T-lift, it's easy. With a tube, it's hard, um, but it can be done. As a matter of fact, when you look at the patients who, uh, who do endoscopic spine surgery, a lot of them will place drains. They've come up with techniques where they can come in at oblique angles and drive a, uh, a drain in. They can pull a tunnel that through. I think it's hard, honestly. Um, I actually do not, myself, I don't put in drains when I do MI surgery when I have leaks. Um, even with T-lifts, um, oftentimes uh, it, there's usually not enough room to easily put one in. Uh, again, filling in the dead space, and this is, I think, where the goal of fiber and glue is. I think fiber and glue doesn't, uh, the data doesn't support it actually sealing the dura together, but it does fill the dead space that could give you some resistance um, because it's hard to harvest fat because if you're harvesting fat, you're actually taking away some of that. You're actually creating a dead space or is isn't some in the, in the MIS surgery. And in this case, you may consider bed rest, but again, the data really doesn't support doing much more than overnight, so maybe overnight. So if you can't, if you have a CSF leak and you can repair it, then by all means, you should repair it. You should absolutely repair it. If you have a persistent leak afterwards, you should try to repair it again. And if you can't, you're sort of in this pathway here. If you can repair it, an on-layer sealant is optional. You can if you want to, you know. Uh, data is now super strong on that, though the personal preference is it can, but then you should think about costs as well too and what else can you do. Once again, you can fill the dead space in the area. And once again, in these cases, even though you've had a leak, if you feel very confident in your closure, bed rest becomes optional. The data doesn't say you really necessarily have to do it. You have to take into consideration what the risks are to the patient thereafter. Now, I do want to touch on to if you do have a leak, though, that persists after this, because this is interoperatively, what should you do? And over the years, I've tried everything. I've tried over sewing. I've tried closing. I've tried dura, I've tried putting dura seal. You know, I'm sorry, Dr. Ruth, I've tried putting on skin glue. I've talked to different friends about what to do as well. So we sort of hate these things. But in general, for me, taking them back to surgery and trying to find the leak and trying to reseal it in well, some way is always the most effective way though my threshold then to put in a lumbar drain has gotten very low. So generally, if you have a CSF leak, you can fool yourself, oh, it's a very small leak. You know, CSF leaks, the water is a small molecule. It will find its way out. So in those cases, I will generally take them back to surgery. 
try to do a repair. And then oftentimes in those cases, I will also try to put in a lumbar drain. And in general for my MIS operations, when I've done that, they generally seal up without a problem and they do fine. And then you don't have to sort of kick the can down the road and keep worrying about it. So again, direct repair is the final, final primary goal. So I wanna to touch upon when you have a CSF leak in surgery, we all freak out. We all go, oh man, you know, shoot, I'm not gonna make it out on time today. It's gonna to be a long day. Wow, this is just my day just went from a good day to a bad day. But it happens to all of this. So what I tell people is you take a deep breath and don't panic, okay? And remember, right now is the best opportunity to fix the problem. Please fix the problem when it occurs. Do a good job because if you have a leak that doesn't seal and you got to come back and fix it later, it's a pain for you. It's a pain for the patient. So even though the leak has just ruined your day, take a deep breath and do a good job and fix it. And you fix it by removing more bone, see the whole defect if necessary, because usually it's at the very edge of your decompression. It's Murphy's law. Um, I'll often position the patient. I'll rotate them away to get them to the highest point. I'll push the nerves back in, close the dura as best I can, do a valsalva to, uh, to test it. And then again, grafter sealant, dead space coverage. And finally, sometimes I've done this before. I have an MIS operation. I have a big tear at the very end. I'll say, hey, you know what? I'm just gonna have to open this up. Open up the incision, remove more bone, do a really good closure in that air. There's no shame in doing that. But what you don't wanna do is later come back, oh man, I should have done something at the time, but just, just wasn't feeling it. So how do you treat MIS incidental deuteronomy? Just sort of wrap up and sort of summarize. Number one is avoid getting them. <laughs> Obviously, we all try to do that, but you know, every case, every, sur every surgery, be as careful as you can. But as you know, MIS incidental deuteronomies can occur in the best of hands with the, with the greatest exercise of care and caution. You know, it's, it's, not, it's not neglect. These things happen because of the patient anatomy, just the way it is. One thing I've changed Informed consent. I tell all my patients about CSF leaks and the possibilities now. You let the patient know, the patient will be aware of it. And that's far better than the patient being unaware and having a rude surprise down the line. Primary closure is always your goal in these operations, right? Patch material, it's supplemental. Sealant, it's supplemental. Closing the dead space. Again, fat has been actually um, been used a lot. I think using fat to close the space around the nerve, you know, around the disc space is a good idea. It's cheap and easy to get. Uh, blood patches you can use as well too. It's also very cheap and easy to get. The other uh, things that are available out there, they all have costs associated with them. Subfascial drain, there's very good data to support. Using a subfascial drain to low suction in CSF leaks is actually a good way to actually lower them. And if you read it, you can actually understand the biomechanics and the physics behind it. And it's actually quite good. Lumbar diversion drains, you can use them for really bad massive leak. Uh, it's not necessarily first line in MIS surgery. Sometimes they're also hard to put in once you've actually lost all that CSF. Um, they're much easier to put in at the beginning of the case. Early mobilization, very good data to support that. And finally, monitoring prayer, I always throw that in. It's You should always follow your patients. It's a very important thing. Always follow your patients, make sure that they are doing well, keep a close eye on these so they don't have any complications or issues and hope for the best. Many of these patients won't have an issue. How many of your patients come back with a CSF leak in your clinic and you say, oh man, that, that's a total surprise. I did not expect that person to have an issue. Whereas other patients, you thought, oh, they had a leak, the repair wasn't perfect, and they do fine. So in conclusion, this is something you'll see in clinic. And, you know, don't fool yourself and think that they'll be gone in a few days. That just doesn't happen. You know how to handle these things. You have the techniques, have a game plan, understand the literature, understand what has to be done, Know that these will happen. Know that you can fix them. And sometimes you won't, and you'll just have to manage it. And that's just part of the job that we have as a spine surgeon. So thank you guys very much for your, for your attention. And I hope this was helpful. Well, thank you, Dr. That was a great talk and uh, brought up a lot of points that uh, I think, as you mentioned before, we should talk about more often because <clears throat> we want to be prepared for these things. Just one quick question from the chat. Um, there was a mention of uh, cervical versus lumbar. Um, are there any caveats that you feel are specific to the cervical spine that we should do differently uh, as opposed to uh, the lumbar spine? Yes. 
So cervical spine is interesting for a few things. I think, first of all, I'm sure when I was in training, we were told that you had to keep the lumbar spine intradural operations flat for three days. The thoracic, you didn't have to, it was sort of a coin toss, and cervical, you didn't. Just because of the way the pressure column was, there was a lot more pressure fluid down in the lumbar spine, putting more stress on the repair down there. Uh, for cervical spine, uh, I think people are more likely to mobilize the patients faster. And, and I think in the lumbar spine too, the data actually says you probably can too. In the cervical spine, I think the biggest precaution I have is be careful putting anything that has too much mass effect in the cervical spine, because with mass effect, you can cause compression. I do know there are case reports of people using um, Duracell. And Duracell, once again, the, uh, the original um, cranial version expanded 50% in every dimension. And if you do 50% expansion in every dimension, that's quite a lot. Um, the new version, I think, only expands 10, 10%. And in the brain, though, we use it, the craniotomies in general are quite large. But in the spine, it's expanded enough that it could cause compression. Compression of nerve root is bad. Compression of the spinal cord is, is, is really bad. Great. Thank you. Um, looks like we've got some comments. Thank you for all our panelists for uh, chiming in. Uh, feel free to, to speak up. Yeah, good morning, everybody. It's uh, Zach Litbeck. Uh, Dr. Rio, thank you. I'm a skull-based neurosurgeon, so uh, CSF leaks are part of my trade. And I think a lot of the principles you discussed are very similar to what we deal with when we're dealing with cranial uh, CSF leaks, especially using fat grafts or vascularized tissue to obliterate any dead space um, and the, the use of sealants for the same thing. We use a lot of uh, lumbar subarachnoid drains to divert CSF, and I think there's a lot of value there. Um, and to your point, it's not so much lowering the pressure, uh, pushing fluid out as creating a, a suction to kill some of the dead space and, and make sure that there's tissue directly opposed to the CSF leak. So, Thank you for your excellent review of the literature. Thanks very much. I was saying with skull-based surgery, there is, and also with the driving of costs as well too, there's been some very interesting literature. There's a friend of mine who does the most microvascular decompressions in the country, and he's moved away from um, doing a closure, Duracell, Duragen, bone plate, you know, that had a lot of costs to just using something like taco seal and then bone cement to open the hole. And there's actually a very good um, review paper that came out on that. It's changed a lot. Taco seal is a very interesting product because uh, I know my vascular surgeons love it because they say it can close, you know, can stop bleeding from major vessels. You slap it on the aortis, I mean, on the aortis, slap it on the veins, it stops bleeding. Uh, people are using it in the dura as well too. And once you've used it, it forms a very, very nice, strong seal. It's a relatively inexpensive. And uh, I was surprised how many people are using that in lieu of other um, graphs these days as well too. And I think the skull-based surgeons really sort of like uh, higher need a lot of that usage. Dr. Chapman, looks like you have a hand up. Else. Yes. Um, sorry, let me turn off this other meeting. So uh, echo Dr. Litvak's comment. Fantastic talk. Wonderful, uh, circumspect and honest appraisal of things. Thank you, Dr. Ru. Um, two questions. One, the bleb. So I do a lot of revision surgeries. And um, uh, at the end of a surgery, I see a, a bleb standing somewhere. There's clearly no leakage to the best assessment, including pressure testing. Uh, what do I do with that? Let's just say it's a five millimeter, roughly, a little bleb. Um, uh, should I preemptively repair it? Should I leave it? Should I patch it? Uh, give me some, some thoughts from you and advice. Thank you. Yeah, Jens, I almost want to throw that back into you. I want to ask you, what do you do with it? <laughs> but what I'll say is that I, I put that in the algorithmic uh, angle of the partial thickness, but we've all seen those blebs. And we're like, whew, got the blub there. What are we going to do? Yeah, you, you want to cover it up. And we're like, don't, uh, we say, we have a say, don't poke the dragon, right? Because um, I think I've tried to close it. Oh, that's a big one. I'm going to try to close it. What happens when I close it? I've converted it a closed CSF leak to now an active CSF leak. And to your point too, Jens, like you, you pressure test these things. The dura is strong. The arachnoid is strong too. I mean, you valsalva these things. They don't rupture. They don't bleb out of there either, as long as the nerve roots are contained. So uh, I think what, if you consider this a partial thickness tear, what the data kind of says is that 
you can put something on it just to make yourself feel good about it. You know, you can sort of cover it up. If it's going to leak, it's going to leak. If you try to seal it up, you made it a bigger, if you try to close it primarily, it's, it's, it's a bigger problem. So I think if you just cover that up with something, it's an option to do that. And then you can put in some fiber and glue to close the dead space or put some fat if you want to. And closing up is just fine. But I know I have seen many blebs, let's say in open revision surgeries too, I've had the same issue. I'll just take a piece of like thrombin soak, you know, not sorry, blood soaked gel foam, just put that on top and then just move on with the case, put in a drain and they generally do fine. It's a blood patch. It's very cheap. It's very easy to apply. That, that's kind of what I'll do. Great, thank you. Now I have an administrative follow-up question. So um, in our brief opto, there's a line item that we have to fill out called complication. If we have an incidental, whatever we want to call it, you gave a very eloquent uh, semantic differentiation on that. Um, uh, if we have a durotomy that was not intended, do we list that as a complication in your opinion, yes or no? That's an interesting uh, question. Um, I actually don't, I put that in my findings and I put that in my note. I generally don't list that as a complication. Um, be, yeah, I, 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 know, I know what you're saying. I'm trying to think, yeah, I don't think I listed a complication, but I actually do know durotomy identified and repaired or something like that in the opera note. I think disclosure is important here. Great, um, another question from the chat. Um, um, there was a mention of radiculopathy secondary to CSF leak. Um, do you feel like there is any uh, difference um, or is anything specific to that type of radiculopathy created by a CSF leak that you've seen? I know that's not a common finding, but uh, just wondering if you had any, any more specifics on that. Yeah, so the, the data that I reviewed that was interesting was on endoscopic spine surgery, where they had a very high incidence of radiculopathy after CSF leak and CSF leak repair. And that was something I was sort of commenting on because it's much higher than you would find with what, what we generally see. I think for, um, for MIS repair and for open spinal surgery repair, the instance of radiculopathy, I don't think it's as much affiliated, associated with, with, a, with the leak itself, unless, of course, nerve roots are herniating out of there or something else like that happened. Great, thank you. Um, just a couple minutes left in our time. Um, any other comments from the group? Uh, Cam, uh, um, I just that that was just a really beautiful sort of practical presentation. I think you know I think a lot of surgeons really uh, would appreciate that, and and um, it was striking to me, particularly the bed rest. I mean that has really pretty big implications just in terms of cost right there, and uh, how it, it's curious how we're all over the map in that and not really uh, you know previously studying that effectively. So I think that's a really uh, really that alone was uh, worth the price of admission today. So I really appreciate it. Great talk, thanks so much. Yeah, I agree with you. It's interesting how treating CSF leaks and durotomies is sort of, it's a, we don't talk about it, you know? It's like, you know, it's like herpes. It's like, oh, you have herpes? You don't <laughs> talk about it, but you don't yeah. talk about it in public, right? And also mm -hmm. there's also the stigma if you talk about it, you're, you're a bad surgeon or you're gonna get sued for it as well too. But I think that's exactly why you should talk because it happens to all of us. And we're all managing kind of in our own ways, but there's a lot of good literature on it. And that's why when I first started asking myself simple questions, like what's the instance of Deuteronomy? I actually don't exactly know, right? And when do you keep a person flat and how long? Like, I know what I do, I know what I've been taught, but I actually don't know what data supports it. And there's a very robust literature out there, which is really, which is really fun to review. Yeah, and of course the the flip side of that, the the patient expectations. You know, if we're if we're not talking about it, then we're not talking about it with our patients. They don't have the expectation or uh, awareness that it could happen, and and that's how you go down the road to lawsuits. So, uh, really important to to increase the visibility of it. Yes, and in patients are now having more surgeries with ASC, and also um, for cost control measures as well too. I think to your point, it's it's very very interesting. Uh, to note that, yeah, you can get patients up and mobilize much faster, keep them in hospital less, because again, with many things that we've known, one thing we do know for sure, keeping patients in bed in hospital longer does two things, increases medical complications, and increased costs. 
with no necessary uh, benefit to actually sealing the hole, sealing the leak. Right. Yeah, no, it's kind of a big deal. Thanks so much. Great talk. Really enjoyed it. Great. Well, thank you so much for participating. It was an honor to have you. And uh, thank everyone for tuning in. And we'll see you next time. Thank you so much. Appreciate the time. Bye-bye now.